indigenous species in Busetum Himalaya, which is a very problematic in, in South Africa. Uh, ecologically speaking, economically speaking, it is a problematic spe uh, species. And he's working with me on the risk assessment of this particular species in, in South Africa. Okay. And I have here Patience Mamataba, uh, who is a PhD student uh, working on uh, population dynamic of this particular species, Medaca longi pitongulata. It is uh, a medicinal plant in South Africa, which is, uh, uh, which is uh, currently facing huge human pressure because uh, the local communities are after the, the root of that plant. And uh, as a consequence, so they have to dig the plant, they have to kill the plant. Now the question is, how do this plant population, how does it respond to not only environmental pressure, but also anthropogenic pressure? So that's what uh, she's been looking at. Uh, the way we do uh, plant ecology or conservation traditionally is that we do, we collect snapshot data, they call snapshot data, uh, and based on the analysis of the snapshot information, we provide a long-term recommendation, which does not actually make sense because the natural system is not static, it's evolving, it's dynamic. So, uh, she'll be collecting data over three years, and we're going to analyze the three years data set and see how this particular product is formed. To so this is uh, uh, another PhD student who is working on the sustainability values of urban food spaces. He does not, uh, his first paper published, uh, I was already here when the paper was published, in the Journal of Sustainability. It is uh, his first paper from his PhD. Uh, what he's looking at here is uh, he's looking at uh, how urban food spaces specifically plants, how do they affect a uh, human uh, health condition over time. And we propose, we propose uh, a mechanism uh, that we have we collected data to test and the, the outcome was published. So, and I have here uh, the DRC student, Greg, uh, who's working on Saika. Saika is a also one of the very interesting uh, plant uh, species. It is uh, the, the most threatened plant group on Earth, uh, the cycad. And here we'll be looking at the chemical ecology of plants, the interaction between this plant and on one side the pollinators and the other side the non-pollinators to understand the interaction between plant and insect uh, so that uh, we can uh, by writing for a uh, recommendation about how to save this species because the species is going extinct. Uh, we have uh, uh, around 60 species in the whole of Africa and 70% of those 60 species occur in South Africa. We have only uh, one species in West Africa from Nigeria to Ghana, uh, to Benin. Uh, so the, the vast majority of this species occur in South Africa, so we're working on the, cycle, uh, the chemical ecology of the species uh, with the expectation of providing information that can be uh, useful uh, to protect the species. And I have here... Uh, so uh, the last PhD student that I want to talk about is uh, Luti. Uh, water is a big issue in South Africa. Uh, it is the, the water stress country. Uh, the, the rainfall in South Africa is half of the global, global average. So we don't have water really. So any project that deals with water is very well funded in, in South Africa. So he's, uh, she's looking at uh, uh, how climate change uh, may be affecting the water availability in the rivers in South Africa. And another objective is to look at uh, 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 how air pollution, you know, uh, South Africa is a, a huge contributor to, uh, to pollution, to air pollution specifically. So how, do, how does air pollution uh, affect uh, the rain formation process? Uh, the paper just got accepted in scientific report uh, recently, uh, the first objective. And She's working on the second objective of her, of her PhD. Can you this? So now talking about myself, I think I don't have much to add to what uh, Dr. Pello 
uh, has uh, presented this uh, the profile, my, my Google Scholar profile uh, about uh, uh, the, the, the summary statistic of uh, the type of research that I'm doing and uh, the, uh, the, the number of publications and index, the uh, H index, uh, etc. And uh, so here, it's just to show, to show that uh, the geographic area of my work is actually Southern Africa. I'm originally from West Africa, I'm from Benin, Benin Republic. So I work a lot in, in Southern Africa. Uh, Dr. Bello mentioned, uh, I mean, reported uh, uh, about uh, my experience with the coming back home. Uh, and he actually made a mistake. I, uh, I completed my PhD in 2012. I started in, 20, in 2018, and completed in 2012. So after my PhD, I decided to come back home to my university in Benin. And along the way, uh, I was told my application disappeared. Uh, nobody knows what happened. So I had to go back to South Africa. So that's why um, uh, most of my work uh, focused here. Although we do some global uh, uh, studies, but uh, all the students that I mentioned, we, we mostly work in Southern, in South, in Southern Africa. And uh, very few studies in the East Africa, especially in the Eastern Arc biodiversity hotspot share between Kenya and, uh, and Tanzania. And uh, one of the objectives of my trip uh, to Casina is to, is to see how uh, I can get involved in, in uh, the into research in West Africa. And uh, we have uh, already working, uh, Dr. Bello and myself, we are working on a couple of projects, and I'll show some of them at the end of this presentation. So that's the story about uh, uh, the introduction of my lab and my team and the, and the type of research that they are doing. So uh, the point number two in the agenda that I showed at the beginning is to look at uh, the evolution of scientific discipline, any scientific discipline. Uh, if you look at it, there are two major stages. The first stage is all about observing and describing. You observe, you describe, you write a report, you publish, or you get your, dissert, your dissertation, uh, your, your PhD, your master, and, and you have the second stage, which use information from the first stage to generate theories and hypotheses. Right, so those theories and hypotheses are informed by the, uh, the, uh, the outcome of the descriptive studies in stage number one. And then, uh, to complete the stage number two, you need to develop uh, theory, I mean, tools, right? It could be a statistical tool, it could be a laboratory tool, uh, it could be a field experiment uh, to be able to test your hypothesis and provide some, some uh, recommendation. What is important about the, the stage number two is that if you have theory or hypothesis, it becomes easier to forecast. It becomes easier to predict uh, what we observe today. Uh, for example, based on climate change, what the common pattern of plant diversity in Nigeria, for example, may look like in 10 years, in, in, in 20 years, in 50 years. So it's only because of theories, assumption, and what we know today that we can put together in a modeling approach to predict what may happen tomorrow. So what may happen tomorrow is so important for management purpose, for conservation purpose, in our case here, for conservation purpose. Uh, so that is the whole point of this, this stage number two. Let's move to that. Now, now, ethnobotany specifically, based on this background, what is it and where are we today in ethnobotany? So before I go to where we are today, uh, I just want to share quickly, uh, what is ethnobotany? I think most of us, we, uh, uh, whether we are from botany background or not, we use drugs, we go to pharmacy, we get sick, we buy uh, uh, medication from pharmacy. Most of those medications come from plants. Right. So how do we get to know which plant to use? 
it is most of the time based on traditional knowledge of our parents in village. Traditional knowledge that we have accumulated over centuries. That's what the, the scientists they use today uh, to identify plants that most likely contain secondary compounds that can be used uh, and be transformed into drugs that we buy in pharmacy. And the question is, not all those plants that are currently used in, in, in village, not all of them are uh, effective in treating uh, given a disease, for example. So the scientists, what do they do? So they collect all the plants that have been made, let's say in this city, for example, and they go to the lab and they do screening and testing of a testing trial and error before they can eventually identify a plant right, that contain a secondary compound, an active molecule that can be used to be transformed into drug that you buy in pharmacy for, for our, our health. Now the question is, this is a tedious job. Now, is it possible for us to preemptively identify potential medicinal plants, potential plants that may contain those active molecules, instead of us spending time, money, and physical effort uh, to, to screen the entire floor of Casina, for example, if we have a tool uh, to identify the plant, the set of plant that most likely will contain those uh, chemicals that we are after, then we will save time, we will save money, we will save effort, physical effort. So that's the whole point of the second stage that I talked about earlier. Now, if you look at uh, uh, the definition of ethnobotany very briefly, it is that science that uh, focuses on this interaction between